Morning. Uh, I'm so thrilled and blessed to be a part of this church family, and uh, I get to see a lot that you guys don't get to see, and so sometimes it's just helpful for me to open a window for you into things that you may not know about. <clears throat> this uh, last week, I was talking with Amber about what's happening in our children's ministry, and she told me about this really exciting study they did last month on honor and what it means to honor people and what it means to honor God, <clears throat> and she had the children write out uh, to someone that they honor, why, why they honor that person, uh, and just got the most beautiful responses. Uh, things like, I, I honor TJ because he's never not my friend. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that cool? I love, I love the language of that. And then she asked students to write why they honor God. And she just got responses like, he's always there for me, and I can always count on him, and I can always talk to him. And I just, I just love what Amber is doing and our, what our great volunteers are doing with our children's ministry and how they're directing the hearts of children towards God. So in case you didn't know, that's happening every Sunday, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, also, uh, I'm looking forward to Christmas Eve with all of you. Uh, many of you who have been around a while, you know what we do on Christmas Eve. What do we do on Christmas Eve? We do donuts. That's right, and we, we do a big, and, and we do a loud and proud. Uh, donuts are a big part of our Christmas Eve. So here's the bad news. They're not for you. Uh, they're, they're, they're for people who have to work on Christmas Eve. If you're not working on Christmas Eve, how many of you are glad you're not working on Christmas Eve? So there are people who are working. Some of you might be working on Christmas Eve. Our emergency service uh, people, uh, medical care people, you know, gas stations and pharmacies will be open. And we just want to say thank you to all of those who work Christmas Eve so that we don't have to. And we do that through donuts because it is the language of love, right? Uh, so make your plans to come here Christmas Eve at 4 or 5.30 and take a couple boxes of donuts with you to deliver, not devour, deliver to someone who has to work. And uh, then I just wanted to make sure you're all aware, in case you didn't know, that our, our church family experienced a, a tragic loss yesterday uh, in our, our community, another lost. Laura Higgins um, passed away due to complications from surgery on Friday, and um, we're just heartbroken for this family. So I just, I just ask that you continue to pray for John and their five children, um, and uh, th there's an opportunity. Many people have asked what you can do uh, right now, they're, they're going to have some financial needs that are going to be difficult, so there's a GoFundMe account uh, under the name of John and Laura Higgins, and if you're inclined, if God puts it on your heart to give, please uh, go and find that on GoFundMe. Um, if you don't do that kind of thing and you just want to give directly, please feel free to give uh, to the church, and we'll make sure that it gets uh, to them, but we we'll just ask you to keep that family in your prayers um, at Christmas time. Yeah. So... Um, the, I think God kind of knows what he's doing. He, he, I've been planning this, this sermon for, for, you know, weeks and then have an opportunity today to talk about questions for God. And it's a day when uh, I have some questions. And I'm sure many people uh, do as well. And so what do we, what do, we do with, with that? So that's, that's kind of where we're going to go today. Um, the title of this series is uh, Keeping Is in Christmas. You've heard the phrase keeping Christ in Christmas, right? You've heard that? Because we, we know that it's tempting to just kind of get distracted by all the materialization of this season, and we want to keep Jesus at the center. But I want us uh, to keep this present tense verb is uh, in mind this year. That It's also tempting to think of Christmas as something that just happened a long time ago in a faraway place that, that almost seems fictional sometimes when you see it in a manger scene and it doesn't seem like real life. But the power of Christmas is real every single day. The things that God introduced into the world when Jesus was born are, are still real and powerful and changing lives today. And so I just want us to focus over the next few weeks on keeping this present tense mentality about the power of Christmas and so today we're going to talk about how Christmas reveals God. It's, there's no question that we all have questions for God, right? It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for 20 years or 20 minutes, or if you're not a real believer at all, if you're not even sure God is real. There have been thoughts in your head, questions, doubts, wonderings. If there is a God, I wonder why. 
If there is a God, I wonder. I wonder if he's mad at me. If, if there is a God, I wonder if he notices the mess that the world is in and what he's doing about it. If there is a God, I wonder if he understands how I feel and what I'm going through. What do we do with these questions? Where do we go? Where do you go? A lot of people will just Google it, right? Isn't that where you go for answers to your questions? You just Google it, right? Google knows everything. Well, uh, Google can get you access to a lot of information. Some of it's true and some of it's not. I'm not sure I recommend that direction. Where do you go when you have questions for God? Some people just write this off as unknowable. I can't, God is, you know, so far above us, I can't possibly know anything about him. These questions don't have answers. I'm just going to move on with my life. Some people will turn to Scripture, which is absolutely a good choice, the right thing to do. But have you ever looked in Scripture for an answer and then didn't find it and walked away more confused than you were before? Where do you go with your questions for God? Here's the good news. We're not the first human beings to come along with questions for God. And the questions that you have that have been rolling around in your head for weeks or months or years are the same questions that human beings have been asking for centuries. We're not the first ones. God knows this is a reality for us. And we can look into the stories of these men and women from Scripture and see how they wrestled with and dealt with the questions that were raised by the circumstances in their lives. So we're going to do that today by looking at the life of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, and see if he had some questions along the way. If you're familiar with Joseph's story, you can probably relate to some of the questions or you can understand why Joseph might have some questions. So let's dive into his life really quick in Matthew chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. If not, just follow along on the screen. We're going to start in verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. That story reads uh, really smooth and flows really well in just one chunk there, but uh, there's a point at which I wish there was a pause. I wish there was like a break and some white space, maybe pages and pages of white space between verses 19 and 20. In verse 19, Joseph finds out that his fiance, whom he's never slept with, is pregnant. There should be a long pause there because in that pause, we should be thinking about the questions that Joseph is having for God. Do you imagine that he had some questions for God? What in the world is happening? The only possible conclusion that Joseph can come to, the only thing that makes sense in the physical world that we live in, is that Mary cheated on him. That, that's the only conclusion he can come to. Joseph feels betrayed. He's definitely confused. He's probably heartbroken. And he's terrified about what to do next. Terrified. He's got a couple options. He can divorce her publicly, which is absolutely his right under the Jewish law and is absolutely the expectation. Her punishment for infidelity is public disgrace that she will carry for the rest of her life. That's an option. Or he can divorce her quietly in a way that doesn't bring her to public disgrace in a way that maybe people are left to their own to wonder what happened. But those seem like the only two real options. The idea of going forward with this marriage in the face of this seeming unfaithfulness 
It's not even on the table. Why would he marry someone who has been unfaithful before they even start? Those are the questions that Joseph has for God. Thankfully, an angel shows up to explain, right? Aren't you glad that the angel said, have you ever wished when in the middle of your questions for God that an angel would show up and just explain everything to you, right? So Joseph gets, gets this amazing opportunity to hear in a dream from the angel. And the angel shows up and this is the explanation. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit has conceived this child. To which Joseph goes, oh good. That makes perfect sense, right? Because the Holy Spirit's always up to something like that. The Holy Spirit's always conceiving children in virgins. So yeah, perfect sense, right? No, that doesn't make sense. This has never happened before. This is not in Joseph's like vault of information he has about God and the Holy Spirit. This is not an explanation. This is God saying, here's what I'm doing. But it's not an explanation that Joseph can kind of take to the bank. Oh, good. Okay, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Can I ask some questions about how that works? Because I'm not really sure I understand the biology that's happening here. We won't go down that road, but it's a scary road. Joseph has still got questions. These questions haven't been answered. The angel doesn't show up to answer Joseph's questions. The angel shows up to give him one simple step of obedience Go ahead and marry her. Go ahead and marry her. This, Joseph, this is, this is all you need right now is you need a clear step to take, a step of obedience and faithfulness that demonstrates your trust in God. Because here's what you need to know, Joseph. God is in this. He is right in the middle of this event. In fact, God is doing something he's never done before. God is moving in to our neighborhood through this baby. Never been done. You need to know God is in this. You need to know God is doing something good. And there's no way you're going to understand. If God were to give you an explanation, it would blow your mind. But you need to know he's in this. He's doing something good. And here's the really cool part, Joseph. He has invited you to participate in what he's doing. And all you have to do is take this simple step of obedience and get married. Now, that's a clear step. Is it an easy one? Is it easy for him to go through with this? What's going to happen when Joseph marries a pregnant woman? What are people going to think? He couldn't wait. He jumped the gun. She couldn't wait. They both are stepping into this knowing that people are going to talk and none of it's going to be good. They'll be publicly embarrassed. And people will look at them differently, thinking that they betrayed each other or they betrayed God during their engagement period. That's what they're stepping into. So the step is clear. Get married. The consequences are also clear. It's going to be a really hard road, buddy. But here's what you get to know. God is in this. He's up to something good. You get to be a part of it. And I just think Joseph demonstrates such faithfulness. When you look at the end of this passage that we read, he woke up and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. That simple. He didn't understand. He, he didn't have like this brilliant aha moment where, oh, I see the mind of God and now this all makes perfect sense. He just woke up and obeyed. And I wonder if it's supposed to be that simple for us. Sometimes we have these questions for God that haven't been answered, but we know what we're supposed to do. We know the good and right next thing to do. And all we got to do is wake up and do it. and Take that simple step of obedience. It's not easy. And it wasn't easy for Joseph. And we're kind of fooling ourselves if we think that this was a picnic for him. It was difficult. It was a hard road. But he was convinced that God was in it, that God was up to something good. And that he got to be a part of this good thing that God was doing that he didn't understand. And he didn't know how it was going to turn out. And he knew he was going to have to pay a price. And he just obeyed. What we want is answers. What we need is a reminder that God's with us. Here's how John uh, gives us the birth of Christ. This is John's Christmas uh, story rendition. One verse, John 1.14 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus moves into the neighborhood and shows us God. That's John's Christmas story. It's pretty short, pretty powerful. This is what God does. And whether you are suffering right now or celebrating, most of us just look for somebody to join us, right? We want somebody who's, who, who can celebrate when we celebrate. They can be happy because we're happy. And we look for people that can be sad when we're sad. We want people to understand. And I think this is, this is a challenge for a lot of people because we don't often turn to God for this. We don't often turn to God to celebrate with us or be sad with us because I think deep down somewhere in us, we're not convinced that God really understands us. We're not convinced that he knows what we're going through. We're not convinced that God is happy when we're happy or that God is sad when we're sad. And we have this question rolls around in our minds. Does God get me? Does he understand me? I, I think scripture makes this very clear. Philippians 2, Paul says that, that Jesus gave up his divinity. He let go of it and became a human. He lived just like us. The Hebrews writer says that he was tempted in every way just as we are. Does God get us? Does he understand what we're going through? Does he understand why we're happy? Does he understand why we're sad? Well, the answer is Jesus does. Jesus does. When you're suffering the pain of loss of a loved one, does God care? Does he know what you're going through? Does he feel what you feel? Jesus does. In John chapter 11, we read the story of Jesus' friend Lazarus who dies. And Jesus sits by the grave and he sheds tears. He weeps on behalf of his friend. Does Jesus care? Does he know? Of course he does. Jesus knew that in just a few minutes... Lazarus was going to come out of that grave. And yet he still weeps with his friends. Why? I think it's because Jesus knows death is wrong. Death brings something into the world that's not supposed to be here. It's not a good thing. It's not something that, that, that we really know how to handle and process. And he weeps for his friends who are experiencing this pain. Does he care? Does he know what you're going through? Of course he does. He knows exactly what you feel. Does God understand what you're going through? The answer is Jesus absolutely does. John 14, 8 and 9, Jesus has just explained some things to the disciples that they didn't understand, went right over their heads. He's trying to tell them what's going to happen. He's going to be crucified, and then he's going to prepare a place for them. And they're like, we, we, wait a minute, hold on. So Philip just kind of raises his hand, speaks for everybody, and asks this question. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Have you ever prayed something like, God, if you would just show up, if you would just like appear and sit down with me and let's have some coffee and let's talk this out, would you just, do, would you just show up? What's Jesus' response to that? He says to Philip, have I been with you so long and still you don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus says, I know. I know what you want. You want God to show up. You want him to just appear and prove himself to you. Guess what? He did. He already did. That's exactly what it means when Scripture says that the child will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us. But even the disciples, after all this time they spent with Jesus, they didn't get this. They struggled to grasp this concept. It was brand new to them. They were accustomed to looking for God in the spectacular, in the supernatural. I mean, what do we learn from the Old Testament? What, what happens when God shows up? There's fire and there's booming voices and there's big clouds of smoke and a lot of times people die and the disciples are like, listen, that, kind of, that God is scary. Would you show us a God that we can deal with? Show us a God that, that we're not terrified of. Would you show us God? Is that possible? Can we know what God is like? Yeah, he's transcendent. Yeah, he's way smarter than we'll ever be. He knows everything. He sees everything. 
He's everywhere. Can we know someone like that? Some people think they already do. Some people, they think they've got God figured out. Because I've observed the world, I've seen how things work, and I can tell you. And a lot of people think, based on their observations, that God is harsh and judgmental and vindictive. Or some people go the other way. They look at the world and the mess that we're in, and it seems like it just gets worse all the time when we say God is soft, or he's uninterested, or he's uninvolved, or he doesn't care. Can we really know what God is like? Some people are fine not knowing. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to change who I am. It's not going to change who people are. But I think God has put in us a longing to know him to be connected with him, to understand who he is. Can you know what God is like? He's like Jesus. I mean, it sounds like an oversimplification, doesn't it? But when he wanted to answer that question for us, that's what he did. He sent Jesus to answer the question about what he's like. Do you you want to know what God would do if his friend died? You'd sit down and cry. You can absolutely know what God's like. He's like Jesus. I want to read this from John chapter 6. This big crowd of people, Jesus had just fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish. They follow him as he, he goes across to the other side of the lake and they chase him down because they want more bread. We pick up in verse 30. Here's what it says. They said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So these people, Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God, and these people are saying, All right, prove it. Do another miracle. Kind of like that one, you remember that one you did yesterday where you made all that food appear? That was awesome. Will you do that again? Because We sure could use some more bread. That would be great, Jesus. Make bread come down from heaven like God did in the Old Testament. Here's Jesus' response. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you, present tense, gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said, I am the bread. I am the bread. I'm exactly what you're looking for. Stop looking to the sky. Stop looking into the mystery. Stop looking in the clouds. I am the bread, and I'm right here. Jesus would get so frustrated with people for asking for a sign over and over again. You want proof that God is real? I'm right here. That's what he would say over and over again. We wonder if God would just show up. If God would just show up. It would make so much more sense. Well, guess what? He did. What is God like? He's like Jesus. Does God understand? Jesus does. I mean, these are not simple answers. They're not clear cut. They're not maybe the answers that you're looking for, but they're absolutely the answers that you need. If you have questions for God, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. The more you know and understand Jesus, the more you know and understand God and you understand his love for you, you understand the links that he went to to have a relationship with you. You understand that when you're happy, he's happy because he created you for joy and when you're sad, he's sad. When you're confused, he's steady and solid. He's always the same. When you're afraid, he's bigger than all your fears. Look to Jesus. I just want to give you a couple clear steps to do that. We have these Advent cards that we uh, handed out last week if you didn't get one of those. Um, Hopefully there's some in the lobby. not 100% sure on that, but I can make them for you. Uh, So just let us know somehow, and I'll make sure you get one of those. But those are just one verse that you read every day in the month of December, and it's a name of Jesus, and it explains this is what the Bible says who Jesus is. And so you get to read one of those a day. So grab one of those or read the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, If you started the Gospel of Mark today, 16 chapters, you would finish on Christmas Eve. So just read one chapter a day, today through Christmas Eve, and you read the whole Gospel of Mark. It's all about Jesus. Get to know Jesus. When you get to know Jesus, then 
your questions have a direction. They don't always have an answer, but they have a direction. Spend some time around Jesus-centered people. Jesus-centered people teach us who Jesus is. When you see Jesus-centered people, I sat with a family yesterday that was in shock and pain and loss. And this man this Jesus-centered man handled everything with this sense of hope that he will see his wife again. He knows where she is. That Jesus-centered man teaches me something about Jesus. Spend some time around Jesus-centered people. Read the Gospels. Get to know him. Because the questions are not going to stop. You're never going to not have questions for God. And if you have a place to look, not only do you get some comfort and peace of knowing that Jesus shows us who God is, but you get to be the Jesus-centered person that other people learn from. You get to be someone that other people, when they're around you, they learn what Jesus is like. That's a pretty awesome place to be. You need the same message that the angel gave to Joseph. God is here. He's present. He's involved. He's up to something really good. And he's invited you to join him. Are you in? One simple act of obedience. And you get to show other people what God is like. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that his presence in our lives gives us confidence that even when we don't have answers, we know we have you. My prayer today, Father, is that we'll see who you are in Christ and that other people will see who Christ is in us. And this is how the gospel spreads. Would you use us to do that, Father? In Christ's name we pray, amen.